final results. Well, you probably have to have an Apple computer. No, it should be it should be done on PC too. What? Oh, um, that's a that's a joke. Actually, that's a gig. Oh, okay, I just it was too quick for me. Okay. So what? Um, you're in the ASCOM and you come up with a option to start a program called ASCOM Chooser? Yes, actually the first part of it is to download um, to your computer the ASCOM uh, drivers for yeah. your telescope. Yeah. And then they ask for in the next paragraph, more or less, to input the parameters of your telescope and your location. Well, have you done the drivers? Point. Have you downloaded the drivers? I got all the drivers. Okay. And then the next one, it gives you a table or a field to enter properties of your telescope? Yes. Matter of fact, in my first email out, that little uh, icon. Yeah, I saw that, yeah. And Where then, is that? I, I got it in an e in a yeah a, a doc. Uh, so you fill in that field and then you press enter and nothing happens. I never get into that field. Oh, yeah, there's no field there to enter. There's no link. Okay. Makes it hard to run the program. Yeah, but there must be another down, another um, an update or something or another program that you're missing. Yes. I don't use that technique. I don't use ASCOM stuff. So I'm not the best person to figure it out for you, I'm afraid. I thought you would be the best and you would shoot this off in two seconds and tell me why didn't I do that? I would if I knew. But I don't well, know. Let me ask you another question then. Yes. Do you think that uh, PhD2 will run without the uh, ASCOM? Yes. For an auto guider? Uh, it PhD2 has internal in it, in its driver. Um, wait a minute, I lost the screen here. It has in it a list of cameras and you must, let's see, is that, or Nebulosity 4 has a list of cameras and you have to pick the camera for the main camera and the guide camera somewhere uh, there. And, when, and once you do that, the, everything's chosen. In the past, when I first started to try to use it, and I had, I think, not the proper um, drivers for my mount. I got the drivers wow. from uh, ZWO, and then later found out that, oh, wait a minute, there's from Celestron, there is a unique driver. So I haven't really tried to use PhD2 since then. Back then, I had kind of a double problem. One at first, it would only show one camera, and then another time it showed two cameras and it told me I had camera one and I had camera two and it didn't distinguish between which one's the auto guide camera and which one's the real camera. Okay. Well, it depends on which order you put them in. I always put in the main camera first. So that's always camera one for me and camera two is always the auto guider. That's what I tried. Yeah. Likewise, I figured the same thing. Now, and the only time I get into trouble with this stuff is if I'm going through a if I'm going through um, something that has to, <coughs> excuse me, I have to line the port up correct, the data port I'm using. And I get all sorts of strange errors if I haven't correctly identified the, uh, the data port. Well, this uh, chooser, the ASCON chooser, basically says that you should enter your data port as COM3. Okay. But I can't do that if I don't have a link to uh, to do it. Now, what kind of computer do you have? Is it Apple? Oh, heaven! <laughs> there no. you go. No, no, it would be more difficult. It'd be almost impossible PC. to do it with Apple. Okay. Um, I don't know. I'd have to get re-familiar with that. Well, get, get here now. He may have some good info for you. Okay. What are we look? What's up? Uh, uh, Ed, you want to? Kind of go over it again, and Dick may be able to help here. Sorry, well, or even okay. Mike. Mike Kubnitz here too. Okay, I have uh, Windows 10 on my uh, laptop here, and that's what I use. I didn't know uh -huh. that Windows 10 does not have. Uh, I keep getting these uh, interrupts here uh, for whatever reason. 
Oh, this is the, my picture of what my. Uh, okay, I'm I can't get this link to run ASCOM telescope chooser to specify the uh, design of my computer and the location of where I'm using my. Uh, Have you got your? No, no, I just said computer. I meant telescope. Yeah. Uh, telescope and my location on my telescope. I cannot run that. Do you, um, do you have your telescope connected to the computer? Not now. Okay, then you need to do it. So well, it won't show it unless it's there. Right. I, I've tried that. Okay. And mm. it didn't show it. Uh, that was my first assumption. Oh, it can't work without the... As a matter of fact, there's a line in the commentary there that it won't work unless it's connected to the yeah. uh, computer. Okay. The telescope. Mm -hmm. There was another thing I didn't know for anybody who has Windows 10 and tries to use ASCOM is that you need uh, framework 3.5. Yeah. yeah. My first attempts were to try to do it, and I assumed that Windows 10 would have uh, framework 3.5. Uh, it does not. No, I had to pay extra dollars to have my new laptop. Um, upgraded from Windows 10 to Windows 7 Professional in order to, <laughs> That's get, what I have. In order to get it. And I'm not going um, forward. No, I'm not upgrade. Yeah, upgrade is to downgrade. Well, I would gladly go if I can get back to XP and something that really works. Yeah. Guess you know, what? It, Down in my lab, I use XP because the software suite that I've written that talks to all my test equipment works wonderfully. And um uh, but if I tried, I tried to run it on a Windows 7 and it throws up, it won't do it. Yeah. So Windows 7 is the last, I'm not going to upgrade anymore. They keep warning me about this, that, and the other thing, but I've got such, I got great virus checking stuff and I, yeah. Microsoft can go pound sand. They're getting worse too. Their invasiveness is, uh, what I don't like is that uh, they've managed to figure out ways to introduce their browser uh, in your standard screens and so forth. And, uh, oh, yeah, Edge. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Edge, everywhere. I mean, even down there on the taskbar, they've got, uh, you know, the yeah. weather and all this stuff. And uh, I don't care to have any of that. No. I have to go dig that out every now and then. But, you know, it's interesting what Ed was saying. Um, now, the, the, the computer that I had before, I have uh, I had Windows Seven and and I ended up upgrading to uh, Windows Ten on it, but it can't it can't be upgraded to eleven. The one that my my most recent computer can be, and of course they tried to shove that at me, and and yet it works fine uh, because I'm using the Auto Guider and everything like that. So I I can't remember. I might have had to do something like what Jerry was saying, though, where I had to change some of the drivers around to make it work. But it seemed to me that it was pretty vanilla. I, I can't remember really having any trouble with it. It was a bit of difficulty uh, trying to get framework 3.5 onto the computer. I have yeah. two computers. And actually, on one computer, they're both Windows 10. On the uh, desktop, it went in fairly easy. But on the laptop here, which is a little older, it uh, kind of wouldn't let me tell me what I was doing, and I eventually had to work around it. I think mm -hmm. the proper term is it threw up on you. <laughs> yes, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ed, so you got the .NET Framework 3.5 to work on your laptop, and you still ASCOM did not work properly for you? Well, without being able to link to the chooser, I can't get ASCOM to work, but I'm going to go back some night here very soon and try to see if uh, PHD2 will run without the ASCOM2. Would uh, posing your problems on cloudy nights give you any kind of input that you need? Yeah, which is kind of disappointing. Back in 2013, oh. one guy complained that he couldn't find it and he would like to know where is it located, the chooser, ASCOM chooser. And the guy, one of the guys replied to him, it's on your computer. <laughs> now, now, all of you know where it's at, right? 
<laughs> Mine's on my desktop. At least there's a story. <laughs> <laughs> and then the hey, other Dick, guy. I notice you're upright. That's congratulations. Well, Stop. yeah. You know, actually, to tell you the truth, I, I kind of blew it because I don't have my brace on. I'm probably going to have to go back and get that. So, uh, but I thought I'd go out to the observatory just to show you what's going on. But, but uh, I'm still hurting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Last uh, comment, maybe here. The other comment was done in like 2017, no, 2021. The guy couldn't find it, and he was told to use a ATF uh, Astro Telescope, something or other. Is that what I said? ATF, I think it was. Oh, uh, uh, um, Astro Telescope Tools. It's a software that somebody's written that will permit you to get this uh, icon yeah, it's showing there. Boy, I hate to think what Windows 11 will do. <laughs> it further separates you from the operating system. Probably. Well, I've, I've got the updated, uh, I've, um, I've got at least 10 and I haven't had any issues with it. Are you able to find the program Profile Explorer, the ASCOM Profiler Explorer, and see if uh, uh, see if it can see that? Because I, I, I've got it up right now. And there's... Uh, yeah. There's one of them they'll say choosing uh, or using chooser. But it doesn't tell you where chooser's at, where the executable or the link is at. It keeps referring me to that what you're just showing. Okay, hold a second. It doesn't say anything about the Vice Hub telescope or simulator. Simulator is just to give you an idea of what right. The numbers are See, and when, if i look in my ascom file it doesn't tell me it doesn't permit me to enter my numbers it will show me numbers for the simulator hmm. so it figures you're at a different spot than you are actually at what's that it figures you're at a different location than you actually are at i don't think that's a big issue I think the real issue is it wants to know what's the focal length of my telescope, how big is my telescope, and right. you know maybe that's about it. And your telescope is uh, one of a kind, right? You made it. Yeah, but that's irrelevant. The focal well, length. No, is... I mean if they're looking for particular brands and focal lengths and f-stops, you might not be one of them. No, no it gives me a complete <laughs> breakdown on this after this sheet here in a file. It gives me a complete breakdown of the questions then I have to answer. And it doesn't ask whether it, well, it asks if it's a celestron mount, but other than that, it doesn't uh, ask specifically what te uh, telescope I'm using. It wants to know the focal length. It wants to know the diameter, the F number. Hmm. Well, I'm certainly not any, any help here. Uh, you know, the, the last program in Windows that I have is XP. But I do have a comment is that sometimes with XP, it's, I mean, with Windows, it's so, it's, it's so. Um, Asceteric? Uh, just, it's just weird. You know, there's just. Obtuse. You, know, you, you have, you have different ways of getting to the same files. And I'm just wondering if you couldn't go into like, say that the, the um, would it, where you have programs, you go into the, the, um, oh, what's it called? The. Um, you know, I probably could do it in XP. I have an old XP laptop. I don't know if it'll run, but yes, yeah, since the win uh, framework 3.5 is in XP, but not in Windows 10, more than likely it probably would show up with my old uh, computer if it were. I'm just wondering if you couldn't, get, you couldn't, you know, sometimes when you go to, you know, start and then all the programs come up, it has a, um, there's an area that just has all your files in it that is unlike what's on your desktop and you can access them through there. And sometimes different things come up and I, I'm just wondering if there's a different way to go into that ASCOM 
than the way you're going, if there's a different route that you might follow, uh, you know, and, 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 if it, and if it may show up differently if you, if you did it that way. You know, you're probably right. I, I, I'm totally agreeing with you that XP it probably would show up. It's just that I don't know if I can get my laptop XP. I have desktops, so I could actually load everything and do it on one of my desktops. Well, I think you ought to try with that because that's what you're intending on using. But I'm, I'm just wondering if they're like with XP, there's different routes to the same thing and or whether it's just a, a very, um, you know, Windows stubborn systems. Well, yeah. XP um, is usually shows you what it's doing, and or if not, you could find out what it's doing. But like yeah. in Windows 10, I couldn't really verify that I had uh, a, a framework uh, 3.5. It did it oh. in an obtuse way, uh, where you put in this line that whatever it was called, and if that worked, then you have it, and if it didn't work, you don't have it. Uh, it wasn't like you could just go there and look at your file and say, oh, there's uh, framework 3.5, like you can on XP. Well, yeah, you should be able to go into the control panel and yeah. look at the drivers uh, yeah, inside the control there. control panel may show you. Yeah, it should show oh, you. That's, you gotta, in order to download, you've got to go to the control panel. Oh, but it doesn't show you. And then what, I love this. It's got go to the control panel and check whether Windows is being used or not. <laughs> well, you can't get to control panel without using yeah. Windows. <laughs> I, I you, you. Dumb. you think that's it's gone dumb. way down? Of course, I, had, I, I had to check that. Otherwise, it wouldn't run. <laughs> and that is just a little note off to a side. It's not part of the main list of items that you have options for. You but know, Bill. Bill Real Gates close in small print. There it is. <laughs> Bill Gates had a bad year last year, you know, and you know he made one too many trips to uh, Epstein Island, and uh, Melissa just didn't like it anymore. So you know, I thought it, they were divorced. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's why they got oh. the <laughs> oh, okay. trips to Epstein Island. You know, and he just had a bad year. So you know, he, you. I think he chose the wrong drinking buddy. <laughs> Yeah, maybe, maybe Ed, maybe you could try that XP just to see if it, it would show you uh, a different path. And then if it, and if, if XP did, then you could go back to Windows 10 and, and see if that might help. Here's something that Tom's got up. Right. I've been this, there. This, this is under Windows 10. You can yes. turn on the different .NET packages, I guess. Yes. Oh. You, you clicked on something, that first one. You don't have the... I don't know. What have you you been to, I, I you, had that come up too. Have you been to the ASCOM site, ASCOM.com? Probably, yes. Yes. Uh, Did you read the directions for oh, installing the platform on Windows 7, 10, and 11? I don't know. Jerry, do you have something 6. to share 6. there? I yeah. downloaded 6.6, .6, Jerry. That's the latest. Well, I got you all beat. I run Windows 98 on my laptop. <laughs> you, this, this stuff, you see it? Am I, am I sharing? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Really, really fast. <laughs> there it is. Number three. Click on turn on turn Windows features on or off. And you better do that. Well, I would do it once with it on and once with it off. <laughs> no, yeah, right. you don't have that choice, sir. You only have the choice of turning it on or off. That, that just shows all the Windows programs that are not, not like separate apps from Windows. So just then that'll show you Net Framework 3.5. And you're supposed to click next to that feature, Windows feature, to make sure it turns on if you need to use it. Right. Now, does it, anybody have it? No. Else have it working on Windows 10? No. Okay. Well, let me get my let me get my old laptop going here. Let me see if I can come up with something on it. See if I can find something. I have Windows 10 and it works. Oh, you do have it. Okay. Do, can you go in there and can we look at the drivers and see how your drivers are configured? 
I so did all this that you're showing right now. You okay? So we've done that. Okay. Yeah, we've done that. And it's all right. It's called the platform. Huh. The latest one is six point six. You but know, Ed, there's a diagnostics. There's an ASCOM diagnostics. Have yes. You tried using? Yes. Okay. That's very good. Good point. I forgot to mention that. I ran the ASCOM diagnostics and I did uh, 1,566 checks and oh. about a zillion pages. And down at the bottom, it says, uh, congratulations, uh, all 1,566 tests passed. <laughs> well, that's okay. So that, that must be mean that you're, you've got to be close to that. Oh, I know. I've been closed for weeks. Uh, it seems like months now. <laughs> you know, hey, you're for it's now. just one more thing. <laughs> hey, hey, Ed, on that number six on that list, it was it was talking about you do it, you enable the three point five framework or whatever, and then at the end you then you install the ASCOM. I'm wondering if you the, install the platform. The ASCOM then you install then, the platform. Yeah, so did you do it in that order or vice versa? Yes, I did it in exactly the same order. Oh, okay. And I was just telling Jerry, the one I got was 6.6, .6, which is the most recent platform. Yeah, that's what this is. Huh. Well, if it's not showing up, there's got, there's just got to be some reason it's not. It, it's, it's, it, it well, there's, a, there's a detailed FAQ list here if you have been through that. I don't know what he's talking about. Particularly excellent questions. Oh, connecting for problems? When, they, when ASCOM says telescope, cho telescope chooser, um, it, it, it lists the telescope simulator for .NET. Is it supposed to see that your telescope is already connected? And, and so you should be able to choose it, is, it from there? It is connected. If it does, if it's not connected, it will go to the simulator. And then next to the simulator, at least that line, it, it also has a button for properties is that some properties of where you can set up a new telescope or something? Where are you looking? Well, I'm looking at the ASCOM telescope, telescope chooser box that Ed originally sent. Oh, oh okay. Are you seeing my screen? Yes. Sir. Should I stop sharing it then? Unless you're trying to find something. No, I, I, there was general silence, so I assume everybody's reading it. No, what, go ahead. I'm not understanding what's being asked. Okay. Well, again, I was just trying to mention that. So it sounded like Ed had the problem. He went to the ASCOM telescope chooser and it didn't show uh, a driver for your CGX Celestron CGX mount, I guess. No, the first part of that is to run the driver for my CGX telescope. I did that. The next step, is to go to chooser and specify what your focal length and your diameter is of your telescope and also where are you located. So that's under, of, that's under properties, the properties button? Well, they tell you run the properties. I can't get that far because I don't have a link to that uh, page. I don't have a link to, the, to running that page, to running that part of the program. The first part of the program, this is weird. The first part of the program is uh, running your drivers for your Celestron telescope. And then it says, click here and then click here and then click finish. And as soon as you click finish, then this is the next step you have to do. And you can't go ahead, click on properties. You can't click on properties. You don't, you don't have a link. Of course, yeah, I can't, I can't ahead, do it. Because, it. No, this is just the <laughs> pictures. <laughs> so this won't, yeah, this just won't it, do just anything. pictures. <laughs> precisely yeah. so oh so maybe there so and you're actually running the ascom program separately you got it going the ascom there's a there's an ascom with this uh icon here in the corner of that picture you can open that up 
And I would assume that I could run it from there, but uh, no, I haven't been able to run it from there. That is run the chooser. Uh, I'm, I'm just, uh, uh, just a second. I, I'm wondering that if, if Celestron, you, you set up the Celestron properly and this box comes up and maybe this is just an image that Celestron gives you, it's not really active. Like if you click on properties, you say nothing happens. Well, so maybe this is just, this is just a picture that Celestron is showing and you actually need to do run an, an ask um, program to, to get to this real box. This is ask on and the preceding is ask on. You have to have drivers that are gonna match ask on. So yes, you got, I already ran the uh, off the day before I or two, I ran the Celestron drivers for my telescope. Now I went to ASCOM and you need to have the interface. You need the ASCOM drivers to match whatever you have. So you run the There's the problem there. First for ASCOM. And then- I think that's the problem. Well, I just did that. And then yes, the, this is words, the second step. One, one of the things you said really early on, Ed, to me was that you, that you found that you had to run the drivers from Celestron. Are there drivers that ASCOM has? No, the drivers come from the manufacturer of the instrument. But okay. ASCOM somehow mates those to the device. It interfaces with them and adapts them. Sorry? Okay. It interfaces with them. Yes, it interfaces with them. And it has to know what they are, yes. Yes. Now, from Celestron, you, uh, you have a program that you could uh, control the, the program within the Celestron uh, remote control program. Have you been able to do that and connect it up that way? I hope so. I, I haven't really gone back to try, um, you know, PhD2 uh, to see if it will now work. Not PhD. Um, uh, yeah. Do you actually have a program from Celestron that you install that sort of acts like a remote control? itself uh, it's a re remote con well it's remote control in the fact that i have a uh, hand controller and i punch in whatever star i want and it no, goes in no um from like with my um cge mount i would um there there was a program that i could control the telescope directly from the manufacturer there's a very rudimentary one this program comes with a Celestron CGX mount, this, this Celestron PWI telescope control software. Okay. So I guess the question is, is Ed, Ed, have you tried running the Celestron just using this software by itself? Uh, I don't know what software I've been using. I've been using uh, Celestron, the telescope. I didn't en enter any other software. But you yeah, have- yeah. Uh, I'm wondering- Go ahead. If there was uh, maybe a, a driver update for your mount that you're missing, but that that's another thing you could maybe look at. Well, that's I like I said the first time I did it was to uh, was from CWO. They said here's your Celestron mount driver, and then later I found out that Celestron had their own driver. And then I lowered it just somewhat recently, weeks ago, I downloaded the Celestron driver. Oh, they caught you cheating on them, huh? Somewhere, somewhere in there sounds like the culprit. How's that? I, I'm just not sure. It's, it sounds like, I mean, it sounds like there is some kind of incompatibility, incompatibility with ASCOM and the drivers you got from Celestron because it, it's not allowing you to go further. You know, I thought that was it. And uh, basically that led me to getting the proper driver for the mount from Celestron. Plus it, I determined that, oh, I didn't have uh, framework 3.5 and that that was the problem. Of course, before all that, I thought it was my antivirus thing was somehow interfering. 
but mm. then I realized, no, it's not the antivirus. It was the fact that I didn't have uh, framework 3.5. As a matter of fact, uh, when I was downloading the 3.5, it said that I did need that to run my program. Uh, I got feedback from Windows 10 that I did need Windows 3.5 to run my program, which mm. I thought was, that's pretty good. Yeah. Do you have a profile explorer? A what? The ASCOM profile explorer. That's what I've got in mind. Now, I, my stuff, I must admit, has been, hasn't been loaded for a while. So I got this thing, it's called a profile explorer. That's an ASCOM profile explorer. And oh. it has all of the stuff on here. It has your telescope driver, your video drivers, everything, rot rotator drivers drivers are all in that particular profile. That's kind of strange because they tell you, you know, right yeah, now, yeah. Not, I don't know if it was pH. Well, no, that was with Here, pH. Let me show you yeah. what it looks like. Here's your profile explorer. Yeah. Yeah, there it is. One of, I got that. Okay. okay so that. there's a chooser up here, which is under cameras and doesn't show you much. Okay, here's your uh, simulator, and one of these is your regular telescope. Right, uh, um, the um, SciTech. Yeah. So it sees that. But if you click on that, it doesn't tell you anything. If you click on simulator, you'll get uh, your simulation. Click on your simulator, and that should show you a, a bunch of uh, numbers. Okay, hold so right. right above there. There you go. Uh, yeah, teleco. Yeah, I got the same thing pretty much. Yeah. A that's little a, bit different on I think we maybe because within the SciTech, that's where I tell it all the things such as um, the proper serial port to connect up to the yeah, um, and the telescope information and location. That's exactly right. And mine says ASCOM uh, Celestron Telescope. And when I click on that, I get nothing. I have to enter those numbers using oh. Chooser, and I can't find Chooser. Mm. Mm. Mike, go up to Chooser on that list. Okay, hold a second. Where's Chooser? Yeah. I'm sorry. It's the third one down. Okay, Chooser Four. configuration. Okay, hold a second. Whoops. Uh, <clears throat> I've got this thing here. Okay, so I don't think mine showed anything there. Is yours the same version? Is it 6.5.1.0? Because mine is 6.000. <laughs> uh, mine 6.6. .6. Okay, so you got a newer version. Okay. Yes. Okay, so you got a newer one. Yeah. Uh, but it's interesting. I got the same thing on the left hand side there. Uh, Okay. What did you have on your uh, telescope? Your uh, down telescope drivers. Um, yeah, yeah. And then on his uh, SciTech. Yeah, that's from the yeah, software. Yeah. What? Com click on that. What kind of? He had COM port three or four. No, um, it doesn't show it here. It uh, shows it within, I guess. Uh, I thought it showed um, it. I guess. Do you have a separate SciTech program, Mike, that connects to yeah. this? Oh, yeah, I could bring that up. Let me. What is SciTech? Is it the simulator? Below, no, SciTech is my, the telescope driver uh, for my telescope. Okay. And so. Yeah, what, is, what, is, what does that name, name mean, SciTech? I can't remember either. Scitech is a company that makes the yes. electronics for the drive telescope drive. Right. The okay, so I'm going to stop telescope I'm going to and Palmer Observatory is SciTech driven. Yeah, so here is okay, so this is the uh, the thing that um, the control panel. I don't know if you can there's another thing called SciTech Skyview, which is like a rudimentary um, Planetarium. It's what's used in the uh, um, the observatories, both at the uh, museum and the college. So I can go to configuration. 
SciTech stands for sidereal technology. Right, yeah. And uh, so let's go to change configuration. I don't know whether you're seeing, there's a setup SciTech version 9.5 X window. I don't know if you see that or not. Yeah. Oh, you do. Okay. So there are different things uh, on here, like I think under miscellaneous is, okay, I, I gotta go and scope <laughs> I, I got to go through this. It, it, it's been six months since I've been able to go on my observatory and actually do anything with it because uh, can you hold a second here. Well, one of these places has got the uh, the the uh, the actual serial channel, I think, I thought it was under miscellaneous, but I guess not. Oh yeah, there it is up at the top. Com yeah, there three. it is, COM3. Okay. Yeah. And so- I thought I uh, saw that initially when you uh, clicked on it before in the other yeah. SCOM. Okay. So COM3, so I, I can go down there and you can see all the other things are missing. So- Yeah, so um, you want to be on Actually, it's probably not COM3. It's probably another, um, because I'm not connected up to my uh, telescope. I think it's either five or six normally. But uh, They say in the literature that I was reading that you, you put it on COM3 and for some people it could be COM4. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like a fake thing, I think. Yeah. It's not real. It's a virtual COM port. Yeah. So well, you, they so got you, rid of the COM ports, didn't so they? you can see here on, yeah. in the scope uh, info, I've got my aperture and a focal length and latitude, longitude, and, you know. All the stuff I need to enter in mine. So I, oh, I have a, I have a problem there. where on my, my uh, computer, the software I write talks to a serial port. And then in uh, uh, device manager, I go tell it that serial port is a USB port. Then that talks off to a thing that converts USB into IEEE 488, it talks to the equipment. And uh, that's one of the reasons I don't change from Windows uh, 98. You don't know how much fun you're missing. Oh, I'm not <laughs> missing any. <laughs> yeah, we're, all we're, immersed, we're immersed in that fun right now. Yeah. 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 10 pounds of fun in a five pound bag. Now, what is this? Okay, this is the other part of the program, the, the planetarium, which you guys probably will be interface with at the, at the, uh, Museum and the uh, um, the the telescope. <laughs> Anyways, that's it. So Ed, it seems like there should be in Celestron should have a setup page that would be interacting with the ASCOM. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's really ASCOM. I think the problem is not with Celestron, but. Uh, but are you like able to control your program from a specific Celestron program itself? Is there a program on your computer that says Celestron CG, C, CXI or whatever the, the, the mount is, and you click on it and you can do simple things like slew and um, stop, track and stuff like that. If you don't, then it's possible, then you don't have enough of the hooks on there to go ahead and uh, control the program from ASCOM. Once you got it controlled from a specific, I believe that this is my opinion, um, once you got it operating from a Celestron specific non-hub environment, a direct connection between a program and your mount, okay, once you got that communications going, then I think um, uh, and it's the ASCOM if it's still not working. But if you don't have that program on there, you don't know whether your computer is actually communicating no. to the mount. No, it may that's what a I've USB been... port, but it may not be sending anything that's intelligent to it. That's what I have is Celestron. That's what I've been using is Celestron. 
the only, the, the only the thing program. now is I want to get my auto guider working. And I was under the impression in order to get my auto guider, guider working, I needed to do something like ASCON, where you have um, two cameras and a mount. Uh, oh, I don't think you need to worry about ASCON if you can control each camera. And you can, I can access control, them. I have to go back and verify whether I can control each camera. Uh, PhD2 yeah. did show me two cameras the last time, and I picked camera two to be the uh, auto guider, but it was yeah. kind of like uh, I was only getting results from one of them. It wasn't it wasn't quite right. I got to oh, go the, back now and try. The to PhD is isn't it only a guiding? It doesn't. It's not an imaging software. No, it's not a camera control system per se, no. but it does interface with the camera control program called Nebulosity. And so they work together and they're the only way I'm able to get really good dithering going between frames because the camera control will stop and move the camera to a new point and then start the next frame using PhD2. I, I, I can do the dithering with the, the SciTech and I think also with the um, AstroR too. Yeah, I'm sure you can. But the way I achieved it is using Nebulosity and PhD2. And once I was successful, I stopped looking for alternative ways to go. What's I had issues with that velocity with uh, SciTech there. It, they don't play well together. That's why I wound up getting okay. Castor art. Okay. What does Nebulosity do? What is what? What does Nebulosity do? Nebulosity is the camera control system. It, it looks oh. through the primary camera okay. and it focuses yeah. it and frames it. And then uh, you set up the sequence, how many pictures you want to take and um, you want to wait or pause between the two. And yeah. it'll just snap off the pictures then. And it'll control the, if you have a filter camera, it'll move the filters for you. Okay. So it's camera control. Yeah. PhD2 looks at the guide camera. It should look at the guide camera. It does look I, at the guide camera, right? I'm not sure. And not just admiringly. Huh? And not just admiringly. Oh. <laughs> okay. Now, some of these programs like I think Nebulosity, I, I know V8, I mean, Backyard EOS and um, SharpCap and all that, they have their own hub yeah. that looks at things. Now, the reason that I got Nebulosity and PhD2 was that the guy that wrote them, Craig yeah. Stark, um, when, you, when I called him up, I've been using him for about 20 years, different versions. Uh, when I call up with a problem, I get him on the phone and he, he's very, very helpful and very friendly. It's, uh, I, I actually bought that before I bought the, the other. And uh, uh -huh. uh, it's just that um, it's not stable with the, with the SciTech um, okay. it hangs up. But for me, it did. I, I, I could never get a... Um, successfully make an automatic uh, modeling because it would just hang up. That's why huh. I got the Astro Art. And then when I did that, then I got my model and then I got my yeah. good uh, pointing. I got, I tried Astro Art for a while. I couldn't really get to work well. <laughs> we all have our... <laughs> but that's just me. So the Stark Labs PhD guiding, is it different from PhD2? No, it's yes. just um, a different version. PhD2 is um, the second version of it. What Craig did was he you buy Nebulosity from him because he updates that. But PhD, he just gave it away. It's open, um, what is it? The source, the source. code is open. And so people have been adjusting it and modifying it and uh, other people. It's sort of like Wikipedia for guiding software. Yeah. It, 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 they've had some really good um, enhancements like multi-star yeah. auto guiding. Yeah. Craig is a working engineer and he, he can't take all his time for his hobby for 
keeping the software update. What's work? So Ed, did we answer all your questions? <laughs> I still don't understand the problem, but I do remember I do remember that I had a similar problem about 15 years ago. And I think that was when I was working with Maxim DL and ASCOM. And I, I that's when I chucked that whole system. I don't recall the, the problem. I don't recall resolving that problem, but it was similar to what you're talking about. It was very frustrating. This is the last step, I'm sure. Right. Once, once I get this to run, everything will be great. So it's yeah, made right it. here. Did you get I'll it to there's... run before you switched to uh, Windows 10? Was it running on that system or is... did you ever get it going that way? Uh, I started with Windows 10. Oh, okay. Yeah. I bet there's I an answer not, somewhere. I was afraid, uh, I was afraid uh, things uh, wouldn't work with would not work with xp i'll bet there's okay. an answer ed on, on cloudy nights somewhere you do a yeah. search and and find you know the celestra on cgx and uh, uh ascom there's there's got to be somebody's had the same problem there are several people that have the same problem but a lot of times the answer is uh similar to it's on your computer <laughs> or, <laughs> well so you know where it's at okay you yeah. won't tell me either but uh, other than that, they'll go through a whole discussion about what ASCOM Chooser does and why you need it. But not how to do it. Yeah. Not how to run it. There's no link. See, my problem, I'll just for a, a quick aside, when I, when I was the manager of a department on uh, system engineering, we were required, because we wrote software for testing, we were required to come up with manuals that we could hand to the customer, which was usually someone in the government. And the manuals, when you write, and there's a problem with writing manuals, because when you write manuals, the person that knows everything about how to do it, they know how to do it. And that they have long since forgotten what the epiphanies were to someone that doesn't know how to do it, what they need to look for. So what you end up with, if you're not careful, is a manual that describes the steps to be achieved at each level but nowhere is how to do it listed in the manual. And that's what you want to have in the manual. So I found out that I could tell by the thickness of the manual if it was useful or not. If it was very thick, it was a philosophy and theory of how it worked and what it was going to achieve. But if it was real thin, it was just press here, press this, then go to this, then press that. It was actually how to do it. And I've run into that. My first brush with a Mac computer was I got them, there's no manual. And it took us a day to figure out how to turn the sucker on. Because no, no one said the switch is in the back and it looks like this. The actual how to do it is frequently not in the manual if it's written by the, the guy that has the in-depth knowledge. Somebody should record this, Jerry. That's very important what you just said. So, like so what we did, what I did in my department, I took someone that had no knowledge of that software and I put them together with the expert on it, and he asked the questions of how to do it, and that generated the manual. Yeah, it's like now I'm, trying to, I'm trying to learn Emacs. Uh, the book is uh, over two inches thick. Yeah. And the table of contents in small print is 15 pages. And there's nothing in there that you will ever need. <laughs> <laughs> it's, even the simplest of things they don't describe so they've forgotten the epiphanies they had in developing it yes if they ever had them yeah oh well oh well so what do, so Ed, just you know is there any is there anything that you could do differently that you that you haven't already tried that's why I'm asking you guys. Yeah. But, uh, I think I need to try everything once more because uh, I, I may have not had everything in there. I thought I did the last time I tried, but for some reason it didn't work. And I think if I cannot find chooser, maybe I can just go straight with uh, PhD2 and, and ignore this problem. 
You know, Ed, uh, I was using my CGX mount with a PhD2 and on an older laptop, and it it crashed every time. Just about get a minute into trying to do auto guiding, it would crash. I haven't tried my new laptop yet with the CGX, but uh, <laughs> so um, that was PhD2, and and it was yeah. uh, somehow just not linking up with the. Uh, the, the star sh shot uh, camera and the mount uh, properly something something freaked it out and it would just crash so don't be surprised no. <laughs> ascom is there when you want for when you want to control a given instrument by multiple control sources so you know by different software so to speak but if you want to if you run it your mount on the software that was provided by the mount maker and you run the camera on the software provided by the camera maker, and you run the guider on the software provided by the guider maker, there's no need for ASCOM in that link up. I hope it's true. I it's only it's true. if, for example, if you want to run your mount by, um, what's the software you use for planetarium called, Tom? The, the Sky X the, or, or, or oh, Stellar, Stel, Stellarium. Yeah, yeah Stellarium. Suppose you wanted to use Stellarium and the Sky X, um, and you wanted to use the software from Astrophysics, all to control the same mount. Whichever one you picked up, that one it would respond to that mount. That then you need an ASCOM uh, hub to go through. Okay, I understand. I agree. I hope. I, I hope that's all true. That that sounds reasonable. <laughs> you know what I've read too. It's just that I, for some reason, thought that I was having problems with uh, PhD2, and I think that problem, I think, has gone away, the initial okay. problem I had. You, I you did not. I did. I'm sorry, go ahead, Jerry. You do need the latest version of the Nebulosity and the PhD2, because there's so many new cameras that come out, and it's got to know, you've got to have the right driver for that camera. And it's got to be able to recognize the driver so it can pop up your um, camera on the selection list. Because in the guide and the soft and the camera control, you have to pick your camera. And it has to be listed there. Well, I don't know if I should tell you guys this, but, um, you know, my uh, mount was made in China. So yeah. the mount was running fine up until December, whatever. On January 2nd, I took it out and I was looking for a star and the thing was only about 30 degrees off. Uh -huh. and it, was like, it was like that, you know, 30 degrees is a bit much. Yes. And then the whole month of January, it was like that. Even after I, during the month, had updated the software on the mount, it was still like that. February came around and bingo, it's working again. Okay. Then I learned that the lunar new year is February 1st. So I think somebody, oh. I think somebody has a practical joke. Okay. And, then, and it has to be done at the manufacturer level to do that kind of sophisticated joke. Uh, Someone was bored in the factory. It was born in the factory. They were bored. So, yeah. Yeah, they were bored, but it was also yeah. born. Born. Yeah, born and born. R N. <laughs> You know, there's, just, there's times when you had to enter in. Uh, I, I, I don't have a specific example for you, but there are times when I was running into problems with a, the old computer and you'd run it, you'd run the, your, you'd run your diagnostics and it wouldn't work. So you'd run it again. And they were telling you, you'd have to do it. You'd have to restart it several times before and it, and it, and it might work. And then I figured that you'd have to kind of like wipe everything off to kind of clean the slate and start fresh. And I, I don't know if that would would kind of work on, in other words, with your ASCOM, you've already- Yeah, Bruce, Bruce was pointing that out with um, the Orion telescope. Yeah, set it back to factory settings and then it works. Yeah, because it, it, it remembers things it shouldn't. It doesn't clear its memory. Well, what happens is you use the mount at different locations and it's remembering oh. stuff from the previous location and you can't get rid of it. Yeah. I've never I experienced that too. It's well above my head. 
when you guys talk about the ASCOM and versus the, you know the, the PhD two. Sounds like it from what I learned tonight. That from what Jerry was saying that the ASCOM is good because it, you're using two or three different uh, yeah. systems. It kind of ciphers them all. And then whereas the PhD sounds like it's just kind of working with the guide scope. Yeah. So and it has to work with the mount too because you got to tell it. You got to you know. Oh, yeah, it has to, it has to, you have to calibrate it on your mount before the, when you pick a guide star and you like that, it's got to move to the east, move to the west a little bit, and it needs to know the, your scope's focal length so it knows how much that it's going to, to expect if it's working, but it has to it, calibrate control. And it's, then you introduce nebulosity into that and it, and it, it, it takes over the camera, right? Takes over the camera. It, it's the only thing that runs the camera. No, Ed, what, what, what's running your camera, Ed? Is it the nebulosity or? No, I, I'm running it with um, ZWO, uh, the Chinese uh, yeah. hardware that came with it. But the problem I have or might have is the fact that I got two different cameras on my system. And um, like Jerry said, he uses camera two for his guide camera. And I that's what I assumed. And, We'll see if it works. Uh, like I said, it didn't work last time I tried, but I, I'm going to try again now. Ed, what I would uh, what I suggest is bring up PhD guiding, okay? And you you can use the manual buttons like Jerry alluded to. There's a, a thing where you can manually uh, slew the the mount from within PhD guiding, so you only have one program controlling things and see if that works or not. Well, you know, it should. PhD2 comes up and it wants you to specify what your guide camera is. But and what about this, your mount? You supposed Well, to that just it. did. I, I wanted to specify what my mount was using ASCOM because it would then distinguish with, you know, the two different ones. But well, I'm gonna just go buy it back and try to do it just with the guide camera on PhD. Right. Well, you're you're going to have to go and select the mount from within PhD guiding. I mean, um, yeah, this is PH. This is PhD to uh, the box that comes up for connecting your equipment. Camera mount. Not sure what aux mount is. Auxiliary mounts, or you can run more than one. Then up here on the right of that, these things light up if you've done it or not done right. it. Right. It goes green. I connect. Think. Mine says connect or disconnect. Uh, connect means you got to push the button so that it will be connected. Yeah. Disconnect. The disconnect shows you're you're connected or something like that. It actually refers to indie mount. That's interesting. Hank uses uh, Hank Lang uses the indie system to control his telescope. When I was up there on your cameras, it gives you a whole slew of cameras that you could yeah. pick from. Yeah, that's right. A yeah. whole bunch of stuff there. So what I, I use the Orion Star Shot, Star Shoot. Yeah. yeah. ZW, now, there's ZWO right here. Has. Now I have two ZWOs, camera one and camera two, which I should have. But you only need one camera, right? The, the right. auto so guider pick, camera. Order. I got to pick camera two, which I did the okay. last time. Okay, well, that's good. Okay. You recognize both your cameras. You just got to yeah. know which one's your auto guider. But right. when you select the mount, does it come up with Celestron? Yes. And this, and, one, this one's not showing. And, it. I, I, I never yeah. connected Celestron yeah. to here. Right. So. But on the Celestron, so when you connect it up, does it, does it, does, does the thing go green and say that it's connected? Yes. It doesn't look like there's a does. choice there. I think I, I, you're not going to take off the runway if you don't get connection. Right. Okay. Right. So and Bruce, that means Bruce, that Bruce, this is my program at home. I'm, I'm not connected to anything. So it's just an example of oh, okay. PhD. Okay. What's available. So what, the, what, that, what that implies is that your drivers are properly installed if the uh, PhD, I'm going to bring this back up again on, on mine. Then what I would do is, what, if you got that connected up, 
go to tools and then manual guy and see if you can cause the mount to move around because, um, oops, it, it won't let me do anything because I don't have a mount there, but it comes up with a little uh, window that's like a little paddle, you know, uh -huh. up, down, right, left, and see if mm -hmm. you can move the telescope that way. That will tell you that the computer is able to communicate with the mount and move it, okay? And now you have an issue with between uh, getting the ASCOM uh, hub working properly. The next thing what I would do is uh, uh, I would uh, do the auto guiding to see if your camera auto guides with it properly to see if if the, if the mount moves back and forth, you know, up and down for calibration. If it does, that means that PhD guiding is able to properly uh, control the mount right. for imaging. That means basically in a simple system, you're there. Um, the other thing I would do is from one of these freebie um, uh, program, planetary program to see if you can connect up to that also. And a lot of times they don't need to go through the hub. Um, as Jerry was saying, if you've got a lot of programs that need to connect up to the mount, okay, to be arbitrated, which is what the hub does, then then that's that's in the area where the um, ASCOM driver starts working. I'm going to try to view it out. Does that sound logical? Yeah, yeah. But I'm going to try not to use ASCOM. I'm going to try to just go with the uh, PhD two now and see if it works. And some and some of the imaging programs like. Um, Backyard EOS and some of the other ones, they have their own hubs that they use to hook up. Not necessarily ASCOM. But PhD, PhD Guiding has its own hub also. Okay, so anything else on on PhD do, two guiding or anything else for Ed? Should we move on to uh, Tim's photos and or Dick's uh, observatory as well? Yeah, Dick, it looks like you got it finished, huh? I did. I did. did, did does Tim want to show something first, or uh, yes. Dick? Why don't you go ahead? And if we got oh. time, I'll 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 do my photos. It's not oh. going to take me long at all in the photos. Okay, let me see what I can come up with. I got a I got an observatory directory here that I I put some pictures in, so I'll I'll see what I can share here. Okay, let me see here observatory. And Dick, what is the name? And uh, let's. Dick, uh, Dick I'm what sorry. Is, what is the name of your observatory again? Crawl. Uh, Crawl the, observatory. The, the, the manufacturer. Ah. Uh, Stellar. Uh, C R A W L. Oh, that kind of crawl. crawling on the ground because I figured that's probably just about where I'm going to be by the time okay. I get done with this. Dog on. <laughs> I thought you were trying to name it K R A A L. Oh, yeah, no, 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 okay. no, 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 let me see here. I'm trying to get these. Uh, well, Dick, what, what I meant was the manufacturer, is it was it Home Dome? Is that what it was? Home Dome, yes, Home, home Dome. What size uh, telescope do you have? Oh, that one there is uh, a 660 millimeter. Uh, it's a five inch objective. It's an MP 127IS is oh. what it is. And uh, now, here we go. All right, let me see if I can bring up something here. Some of this stuff you've seen already. 
but I'm going to try to I'm going to try to show it to you in order if I can. So I'm going on to the file server and I'm out here at the observatory, so it takes a little bit more time for me to do this. So let me see what I can do here. Share screen. This is something that uh, if you hadn't seen it before, I'll show it to you again. This is kind of what I started with. Now, what I found out with this doggone thing is you got to lay everything out. You cannot, the instructions do not equal a product. They don't have design control, good, good enough design control on this project or product. The issue that I found that was most irritating is you see these guys right here, you've got these little flats on either side. There's a, the base ring is clamped to the top ring, top rings on the outside. Okay. And this base ring has a doorway in it. Well, this doorway, according to their assembly instructions, was 36 and a quarter inches is what they said. So I left that, laid it out that way. Turns out, then I get the door out, it's 38. So there's a good example <laughs> right there of you got to lay everything out and it's not a kit. Everything has to be cut. So what I did is I took this top ring as the gospel. And see, it's already got holes in it, see? So I says, okay, that's going to be, if they put holes in it, they had to put it in, in there for a reason. There, these things, these rings come in three pieces, by the way. So I clamped that ring to the base ring. And uh, and that got me pretty close, you know, with, let's say within the thickness of this guy right here. Okay, so let me show you what we've got here. Oh, I got to go to the file server here. Then the next one is another one that you guys have probably seen before too. And it is uh, when I just got the structure built up. So let me show you that. Some of you have seen it. And this will show you what it looks like when, when you just got the aluminum structure up. It's got the bottom ring, top ring here, and then the wheel ring and dome ring are on top right here. Now, when they told you to put the stuff together, they said, put these supports all the way to the bottom of this, of this, uh, where this uh, uh, angle piece is right here, which is what I did. And that ends up causing a problem later on, which I'll show you what that is. I didn't have any real issues here, although I found that what I needed to do was unscrew a few of these when I put the supports in on these guys right here, because it was just a little bit short. And so what I did is just loosen them up and then I tighten them back up once I got everything tightened down. I, I did the whole nine yards right there. There's about, there's three of these cords. I've got about four of these uh, Tapcon fasteners in per cord. Uh, This looks like it's set up for a far wider than a 30 inch door. Where the rings, uh, these different rings come together and there's also- No, the whole of the ring, the thing you're looking top. at where the bottom ring doesn't go uh -huh. all the way around. The door opening. The bottom is. ring is, you got a door. You got the door opening, see? So you, you gotta you gotta figure that door opening into the whole thing. I, I guess I'm not getting it. What, what are you trying to say? Well, Bruce is thinking. Well, that it it looked like the door. Bruce, Bruce. Well, looked like the door opening was far wider than thirty than thirty Did I inches. Lose you? Originally, he said thirty six, and they turned out to be a thirty eight. I lost you. Uh, well, no. Originally, it said thirty six, and you learned it was thirty. Then you showed the picture, and the thirty eight opening 38. appears to be far wider than thirty inches. Yeah, thirty eight, Bruce. Thirty eight. So oh, 36 38. was what they said, and 38 is what I got. Ah, okay, that makes more the door sense. Was bigger, okay. So I had to relay the whole freaking thing out. You know, see, it was just like, <laughs> I just couldn't believe it, man. It was bad. Anyway, uh, let me see where we're at here. We, uh, do I have, still have anything up? Okay, here we go. All right, so then what we got there, the next shot that I want to show you is the, the observatory basically ready to put the dome on? Okay, so I got these two, two, okay, no, it's like, here we go, 
show you. I'll share that with you. <laughs> that might help. Uh, so I got these two guys here, two by fours. That's where the dome's going to go on. We got to walk it over about 120 feet. And then I don't have the doorknobs on. That's another thing, this door. Okay. You notice that the hinges are on the outside. Yeah. Well, that, that, that means is that they have to have swaged in pins. All right. So if they're swaged in pins, then how do you adjust the door if it doesn't work out right? Well, the problem was this, you might even be able to see it here. See how the gap is wider at the top than it is at the bottom. It's actually scraping in this corner right here. So what you need to do is you take, normally take the pin out and then you take a crescent wrench and you pull the loops towards the door for this particular fix to pull that door up. And uh, I couldn't do that because you can't take pins out. So what I did is I just did the crescent wrench and I just yanked on that thing and yanked on it, and yanked on it, and yanked on it. Not to the point where I could screw it up, but to the point where I could get that door up to keep it from scraping and it's fine now. Uh, and so then I got all the door hardware off. This roof panel, these roof panels come in three sections and they all had to be cut. And, it, and it's a totally contorted surface. I, I ended up using the Sawzall, but- Oh, wow. Yeah, these joints in between, this is this polycarb is what this is made out of, this, uh, huh. these roof panels. And these joints in between, they, they rest on top of that, those two inch pieces, see? And then you put screws in on either side. To, are they uh, an overlap joint? They're not overlap. They're uh, okay. what they are is they're seamed on top of the two uh, of the uh, aluminum uh, riser, and then you just go ahead and caulk it in. But the issue is here, and I tell you, it was a son of a gun. It's one of these things you learn the hard way. Uh, what you really have to do is you have to do one of these panels at a time, okay, and then get it all fastened down and cut correctly, then make marks on either side see and then pull the panel off because otherwise how are you going to clamp the next piece see you got to be able to clamp the next piece and that's the biggest problem with this whole thing now let me show you what happens to um one of those joints there uh i'll show it to you so you can see how crappy it is but yeah, actually it turned out pretty good gotta just really um, finger up that uh, polycarbonate uh, and i, I gotta tell you a little secret what i did on that too Okay. And uh, that's this guy right here. And you can kind of see how crappy the joints is. So that's then what I ended up with is this gap in between. So I put R2, I put the regular uh, caulking down here. Okay. And so all along this seam, but this these these roof collars, as you can see, these roof collars, they go all the way up to the top to where this uh, uh oh piece comes out see yeah it's too yeah. tight and so what ends up happening is you've got this big space in here in between here and the upright support so what i ended up doing <coughs> excuse me is i got this stuff it's called tight fit it's t-i-t-e-f-i-t -E and it's uh made by loctite you can get it down yeah. at uh, lowe's uh -huh. and it's a spray in foam sealant so it yeah. has moisture seals too as well. And I just squirted that thing in there. It makes a nice little pillow. And then you just let it come out, you know, just let it extrude out. And then once it dries, just come along with a long razor blade knife and just cut it, cut it uh, right. Sure. Through. And it, it sure. worked really good. It, it, yeah. you know, I'm not a craftsman like Tim and Jerry, but it, it did came, come out good. But, but unfortunately, the way to get these things tighter is you're going to have to put them on, put the screws in, draw your lines, and then pull that panel off so you can do the next panel the same way. So, well, Dick, that tight that tight fit might be a great idea because it's more resilient I'm than getting, a static fit. I'm getting. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm kind of breaking up a little bit. I think it might be the internet is screwing up a little bit, or or me. Yeah, 
or both. Anyway, let me keep going here as long as I can, and uh, and I'll show you what where we're at. So we got. I showed you the one where I had the lay down right there, and then uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, let me get this guy here. Are those support wheels we see there in the middle? I'm no, sorry. They look like hold down screws with uh, oh. gasket uh, heads. I have no idea as the size. There's no no fiducials there. There's your dome. And that's just before the move. I clamped these guys open here just a little bit and kind of tried to bias them so that that it wouldn't move while we were moving it. So basically, we had to move this guy about 120 feet. That's not too bad. And it's about, I can pick up one side. Uh, I'm going to say probably 150 pounds, maybe, for the whole thing. So 75 pounds a side. All right. So then. <laughs> Dick, how was your back after Sorry? doing that? Dick, how was your back after doing that? Your back. I'm losing you. Are you getting me okay? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. So then um, let's see here. Um, basically, uh, I'll, I'll run the dome raising. And uh, let me get it started here. So then, hold on a second. Okay, so I got that going. Let me see if I can get you over here, to here, to here, to here, to here. Okay, we're getting ready to raise it right here. And I got six people on this guy right now. And we're out there on those two by fours that I showed you in that other picture right there. And then, and then Caleb and I are going inside, just like we said, and we're going to lead that leading edge. See how it's kind of crooked now. Is it sitting on its rollers? Not yet. Okay. Now you. Now we're close. Yeah, that's it right there. And it. It, it actually sits on top of a ring that sits on top of those rollers, rolling rings. Okay. The, the only issue that I've had is on these rollers that are uh, up on here that where the screw, the axis screw goes through the roller, that drags in some places, but all you need to do is just move back it out a little bit. I haven't gotten that, done that yet, quite yet. So that's the end of that. So whoops, I guess it didn't quite get all the way through. But yeah, we got, it was really easy. And so everybody, <laughs> as you can see, we're pretty happy about the whole thing. So it, uh, it worked out really pretty well. And then now let me show you a few things inside just so you know what I've done here. Um, let me see if I can tell you, show you here. This, this is probably... One of the things that I did do that I, I, I like a lot is I put my workstation on a lectern and I'll show that to you. I really like it. Um, let me see here. Satellite the Museum's Observatory. I'm sorry, yeah. the planetarium. Yeah, yeah, so oh, that's yeah. what I got. I got like a little lectern. You can actually move this thing up to about four feet in height. Now, I don't need all that and it tilts and all this stuff. And I, like I said, I don't need it. But what I like about it is it's pretty, uh, its strength is pretty good. It, it's uh, it is pretty rigid. And what I've done here, as you can see, I got a power cord and then I got the USB cable, which goes through the floor, you know, and I've got like a little conduit that goes down underneath and then up. So that way you have a free space to walk through. You don't have to worry about tripping. Uh -huh. 
so that that worked out pretty well right there and uh let me see any only thing else i got to show you probably would be um the uh uh let's see here now your conduit with the wires it comes up in the side of the dome not in the center it it comes up to the center and then goes over to the side about a, a foot or two from the side so okay. uh it, it's kind of like you know you could there's, you could put a rack mount down inside there, and uh, and that would would work out pretty well. Uh, is that? Can you see that? Uh -huh. Yeah. 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 That's that, that's, that's nice. Scope book up right there. That's basically the what I've got. I don't like the cable setup because I mean, shoot, look, I got the doggone tie wrap to the scope. So if I want to change the scope, but, but what my intentions are, you know, with with especially with these two heaters is I'm gonna run audio cable up and I'm gonna have an audio cable break out that way, one here and then one back here, depending on what I wanna use. You know, If I wanna use, let's say the 10 inch and I got a mirror in the back versus uh, let's say this guy here where I wanna heat it in front, uh, I can do that sort of thing. So it'll be a little bit more uh, customizable, uh, shall we say, but basically it, it, it just kind of goes down this axis here and then rooster tails out from there. Is basically what I've done, done right there. I you have some. I'm sorry. I, I like the roller system that you've got there. Oh, you mean the for the the dome? Yes. Well, yeah. I know. I like it too, and I like the roll away stuff too because I'm going to get a roll away tool chest. One of those uh, uh, huskies. Uh, they've got a small one. And I'm going to use that for putting in, you know, eyepieces and small scopes and lenses and things like that. Uh, and just a, something I can have as a table to put stuff down on. Now, I have another little thing that I wanted to show you. If you remember the last time I was here, which is a while back, I, I'm going to be getting uh, surgery on the 25th, by the way. So, uh, yeah, it's coming right around the bend here. And so I wanted to try to get in here before that happened. But anyway, we were talking about sound in space, and 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 Tom asked a, a very curious question. You know, what, is there sound in space, or why are you talking about supersonic versus uh, hypersonic and things like that in sound waves as far as space goes? And so I, I ran a little, I put together a little presentation on that. If you guys would like to see it, it's not too bad uh, nor too long. Uh, I call it the sounds of space and time, and I'll just kind of put it together for you here so you can kind of see it. We can cover it relatively quickly, I think. Um, we'll try to anyway. Okay, so we, we start kind of with the definition of sound waves and what they are. They are mechanical waves. This is from Holiday and, uh, Hall Holiday and Resnick. I don't know if you guys are familiar with those. Oh, yeah. I have yeah, I mean, everybody that's gone to college knows that. It's my textbook. Yeah. yeah, mechanical waves that can travel through gas, a liquid or solid. So that's basically what sound waves are. That includes quite a bit of stuff right there. A bow shock wave, I was calling it a bow shock wave, but it's actually a bow shock wave. And it got its name from the bow of a ship because that's the waveform that it produces. It's actually a sound wave too, or at least can be described by sound wave behavior. Is a disturbed sound wave characterized by an abrupt, nearly discontinuous change in pressure, temperature, and density. So for example, when, you're, when, when they were testing out the F-104 fighter, you know, the high-speed wind tunnel at NACA, uh, they were trying to do some of these uh, supersonic tests and so forth. Now, this, this wind tunnel is at Ames Research Center, and it's about 2,000 miles per hour capable. This, is, this particular picture right here is uh, June 18, 1956, Life Magazine. The guy in the picture on the right there is my father. And he was uh, an aeronautical engineer at Ames uh, during the 50s. And he, um, he uh, developed uh, a technique for defining stable flight 
uh, at that particular time, the, you know, people running around with slide rulers and they didn't have, you know, computers and heavy duty computing and so forth. So they had to do everything kind of by hand. So they had these things called rotary stability derivatives. That's kind of what his forte was. The link I've got down here is a link that describes the testing that these guys did. But basically what they did is they did they did all this testing i didn't put it on here but anyway they what they did is they tested this plane using heat from a rocket engine and they directed it at the plane uh to test it uh its high temperature capabilities as, as if it were flying at 4500 miles per hour so, and the exhaust temperature was about 3000 degrees Fahrenheit. That makes a bow shock. My point here is you don't need to go supersonic to get a bow shock. And you can get bow shocks in various ways. There's all kinds of bow shocks in space and they're all described by sound behavior. Uh, you know, you have a, a sound horizon uh, the, the speed at which it propagates is based on sound theory and, and physics. Uh, so this stuff is very prevalent in space. Now we're going to come to something that's really, if you don't know about this, it's really going to blow you away. This is that picture that we were showing that last time where there's a bow, bow shock right here. This is a bow shock. So that's, that's kind of what we were, we were talking about there, and that's what brought that up. Now we're going to get into some kind of interesting stuff. What I got right here, this is plagiarized, and I'm going to have to figure out if I'm going to ever write this into an article, I'm going to have to figure out a way to um, uh, put it in some kind of a form that it's not plagiarized, and also more of a, a conceptualization that a layman can take, you know, and understand. But basically what they did is they produced these graphs based on linear perturbation theory. And they have a mass profile of perturbation for the four basic components that make up the universe. That would be dark matter, gas, in this case, it'd be baryons, which is the fundamental particles that make up uh, atomic uh, physics. There's photons and then there's neutrinos. You can see that the age here is 14,433 years after the Big Bang. Each one of these waveforms here is the sound wave. Okay, you have a dark matter sound component and you can see that the baryonic and photonic mass, uh, these particles are closely coupled and right on top of one another. The neutrinos are down here. They're roughly have about the same peak. Down here along this axis here, is the sound radius, the current sound radius of where it is propagated to. So now you come to a later time at 0.23 million years, and you see that these waveforms have kind of spread out some as the sound waves propagate through. You still see that there are photons and baryons in a fluid together, closely coupled, still closely coupled. Now you go down to here and you see that now what has happened before, besides it being 0.57 million years, the photons have decoupled from the baryons, coolied enough or whatever the heck it is. The propagation speed of these photons, this is, this is not photon line of, stuck, line of sight. This is photon, photon scatter. So this, that, that fits very well into sound theory. So you could have line of sight, then, it, then the speed at which it would propagate would be the speed of light, okay? But since it is they're running into each other, the speed of the sound wave is the speed of light divided by the square root of three, roughly. And the way they figure this stuff out is just the way they always figure stuff out. They use a power series and they take data and they think, well, it's approximately square root of three. So once this decoupling process starts to occur, you start, start to see that the, these waveforms for the photon and baryon, or uh, photon, uh, photons and neutrinos are starting to level out, okay, and become nothing. Now, essentially almost nothing here, look what's happening to the dark matter curve 
as well as the virion matter curve. Okay, they're kind of coinciding. You made this little dent in the dark matter, and here it's even more pronounced. And not only that, you have this radius that's 150 megaparsecs. Okay, so this is all theory. Now let's go to the real story. These guys got this bright idea and they decided, hey, you know what? Let's take the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and let's figure out the, um, let me see if I can reduce this a little bit so that you can see the graph a little better. But let's see if we can figure out what this graph here is. Let me get it down a little bit more so you can see it a little better. The graph is what is called a correlation function. Okay, a correlation function is exactly the same as is similar to what you do when you when you do a stack of image data. Okay, you're correlating the data. You're taking, let's say, the mean of all of the pixels and trying to get the best fit of those all that data. That's the same thing here. But in this particular case, what they're doing is they're looking at co-moving separation distance of galaxies all across the heavens using the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And what they found out is, guess what? This shows a little less than 100, 150 megaparsecs, but if you take the conversion down here, these this is co-moving. So it's H to the minus one MPC. So the conversion is 150 megaparsecs. You got the bump. What does that mean? That means that what you've got is you, if you look at what you've got in the data here, you're going to correlate short distances between galaxies for a lot of them because you've got clustering, see? So those galaxies are going to be really short. What you're not, as you, as you get further and further away, as the galaxies get further and further apart, you're going to see this curve kind of go down here and become asymptotic to zero. Okay. But we got this little bump here. That bump is the recombination. And what happened when that recombination occurred is it produced something called baryonic acoustic oscillations and a, a, an acoustical standing wave of sound. Okay, so now that we have that, what does that mean? What that means is there are density fluctuations superimposed on what we have right now that occur every 150 megaparsecs. So in other words, you'll have clusterings of galaxies every 100, and then they'll go down and go up just like a sine wave, okay, in, in density as you go across. So that's, that's, the, that's the takeaway that you have right there is the entire, in the entire structure of the cosmos has this baryonic acoustic wave superimposed upon its density fluctuations. Now we can go a little further with this. Let's take a look at the CMB. When they ran the CMB, and they used the WMAP satellite first. Uh, they, they did send up some stuff and balloons and things like that, but they couldn't really get any data. Now, this is for the astrophysicists, but basically what you're doing is you're looking at temperature fluctuations here versus angular scale. There's recombination. There's your baryonic acoustic oscillations. They're imprinted in the CMB, okay? So then you go over here and take a look at the Planck. Planck. Now you notice the resolution on, on this is not really that great, but you will never ever at this frequency be able to get any better resolution than they got with the WMAP satellite. This is the best you can do. And there's a there's some formula. It's kind of a Dawes limit thing, I think. This is the frequency. When you go to Planck, you get higher resolution, but you are at higher frequencies and as a result, and you got the same thing. So where did you get these graphs? What What's the That's site? That's in that book, that cosmology book. That oh, okay, good. I've got that, that book. Yeah. I haven't got, you got it. You got it? Yeah. Yeah, that thing is unbelievable. I mean, yeah. I'm having so much fun reading it. 
Now, I believe the reason why these damp out is something called silk dampening, and it's in the book too, they talk about it. But, and then there's this uncertainty region here, and they think that there's, the reason why this thing is curved up here at the beginning, there's some kind of reionization going on. They have no idea. But evidently, there's, it, it, at that time, it was more abundant with helium than it was with hydrogen. And so, uh, I, and so I don't know what about the uncertainty. They, they really don't understand what's going on here too much at this angular scale. This is a power spectrum. They call it an angular power spectrum. It's basically what it is. Okay, so what this means, you know, that's nice and dandy, but it's all there. We have a sound, we have the sound wave that was occurred that occurred, this, this standing wave that occurred there that is both embedded in our cosmos and is also embedded in the uh, CMB. But you know what's really good about this thing? You have a standard yardstick now to measure distance besides redshift. It's probably one of the most significant finds in this century in terms of where we're going with things and in our understanding and yet another way to measure distance besides redshift and you know maybe verify that 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 is uh, that's the case that's so, very interesting yeah I, I was really you know I got to thank Tom because if we don't ask these questions we never find these things out yeah. you know and and, and and the thing we, we got to do is leave our egos at the door and be curious, and, uh, and 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 this really helped me and inspired me. I feel like I want to write an article on it, but but the issue here is that all that is quite correct. It, you know, that's basically plagiarized stuff. See, so it all, all has to be regraphed and and uh, put in my own way, uh, so that uh, it's not plagiarized. Yeah. Okay. Very Dick, interesting. Dick, Dick, we ran over time. or nine. I'm 10. sorry. I'm so sorry. So, I think we're going to have to look forward to that write up. I hope you get that done so we can get your, it's going get to your take words a in writing. It's a long time to do that because there's a lot of graphics that have to be done. And then I have to think really a lot about how. But yeah, you can get it. We're, we're going to get there one of these days. <laughs> and, what, and what was the name of the book that you guys are referring to? Oh, it's called uh, Extra. It's called Extra Galactic Astronomy and Cosmology. Okay, and you can get it on uh, Amazon. Uh, Amazon, and it is an introduction. The guy is, uh, it's a Springer book. I think if you put that in there, you'd probably get most everything you need yeah. out of it. Okay. Uh, it's heavy. Okay, I mean, in terms of the math, you're going to have integral uh, calculus, you're going to have diff uh, differential calculus, partial differential equations, but the issue here is read it anyway, because most of that's derivational stuff. And you're going to get it down to some simple relationship that you can actually use, see? So, you know, like uh, C over the square root of three. Uh, he shows a lot of derivational stuff. I haven't worked through the problems, but you can if you want. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. No worries. Tim, Tim uh, can you hold your stuff until next week or? Oh, absolutely. Oh, I'm so okay. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's a, it's all good. It's all good, Dick. Okay. Um, mine is very boring compared to this. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, everybody's got something to say. <laughs> all right. Let, let's, let's let it go at this point, I guess. Um, so thanks, everyone, for showing up and okay. making it a worthwhile evening here. Thank yeah. you, guys. Yeah. Bye. Yep. Bye-bye. Thanks for the Bye-bye. So long, Thank folks. You. Ending for all.